Good morning or afternoon or evening or whatever time of day it is for you when you're watching this. <sighs> just, just another day in paradise. You can probably hear my dogs and my chickens because that's, that's life. Anyway, <laughs> um, so this next, really, aside from our introduction to the scientific method, really our first um, major biological topic that we're going to talk about is evolution. And um, I like to break evolution up into um, a little bit differently than your book does, because your book, I think, kind of mixes it all together, um, which I think is sort of confusing. And actually, I think um, in some ways kind of perpetuates some of the confusion that people have about evolution. So I like to do it a little weird, which makes your reading assignment strange, but it is what it is. Um, so the other reason that I'm skipping from chapter one to chapter seven is really nothing in biology makes sense um, without understanding evolution. So even though some of the things we're going to talk about in chapter seven, you haven't learned yet, right? So we're going to talk about genes and we're going to talk about inheritance. And, you know, we haven't learned about that stuff yet. We haven't even talked about what cells are yet. Um, but that's okay because fundamentally it's important to remember that when evolution was first sort of understood and described, people didn't understand about genes and all of that other stuff either, okay? So it's all good, right? So we're gonna go a little out of order and that's okay, it's, it's for a reason. Okay, so the way that I split up evolution is I split it into microevolution and macroevolution. So micro meaning small, right? And macro, of course, meaning the opposite, which is large. So um, I'm going to, this week, we're covering a series of lectures on um, microevolution, okay? And then next week, we're going to be tackling a series of topics on macroevolution. And so for right now, you might be like, I don't know, what's the difference between small and big, right? That's what we're, that's one of the things that we're going to kind of explore, okay? So First, let's talk a little bit about why this matters. So as I said earlier, fundamentally, nothing in biology really makes sense unless you understand um, evolution, how it happens, what it is, okay? Um, so fundamentally, it's important for our understanding of um, everything, <laughs> okay? Um, on a more sort of personal level though, um, right? So as like an individual, why should you care, right? Other than just being, you know, knowing things. Um, you should care because evolution is primarily responsible for all kinds of things in your life. So from what you eat, right? To um, how those foods are produced, right? Evolution has a big impact on those. Um, Medicine. Evolution is tremendously important in medicine. Understanding how um, bacteria and viruses evolve, right? Um, really, really important. That's what the little MRSA picture in the middle is about. We'll talk more about MRSA in a minute. Um, understanding ecological um, concepts, right? And sort of how, how the environment um, impacts organisms and how that leads to evolution is also really important, right? Sort of for everyone. So this kind of stuff comes up again and again and again. All right. So where are we going to start in this discussion? We are going to start by talking about the father of modern evolution, right? And so I'm sure you all have heard of him before. His name is Charles Darwin. I like to call him Chuck. Chuck D, like we're friends, because no. Anyway, so um, Chuck was an interesting dude, actually, um, as were a lot of the really sort of early um, biologists. Um, Charles Darwin was, um, a, a, you know, a fairly wealthy British guy, right? I like to say that, you know, all, all, all the majority of the biologists that get any attention these days, you know, well, 
I shouldn't say these days, the majority of the biologists that we talk about in a class like this are old dead white guys, right? So Chuck D is definitely an old dead white guy. Um, more modern biologists, not so much. Okay, but anyway, I digress. So he was a preacher's son and um, his father um, wanted him to become a doctor. Um, it turns out he couldn't hang. He couldn't like handle blood, right? And, and all that stuff. And so he was like, nah. So then he was like, okay, I'll, I'll go to seminary and I'll, you know, I'll do that. Um, so, you know, he was, he was a very religious man, which is true of a lot of biologists as it turns out. Um, and so he was kind of this interesting guy. He was just sort of like aimless. He didn't end up finishing. Um, he didn't end up becoming a minister. Um, he just like, <sighs> he was really into like nature and he had this kind of like wandery, like I like being outside kind of personality. And so when he was a young man, um, he signed up to go on a, a boat ride, <laughs> right? And so he signed up to be the naturalist on the HMS Beagle, right? And you can see a picture of the Beagle there in the corner. Um, and this boat ride took five years. So it was, an, it was a time commitment, okay? Um, and his job on the boat was, uh, you know, really like a, like a, you know, a naturalist stream, right? He got to, you know, sort of investigate things that he found in all of these different places and and just sort of like hang out and read and nerd out all the time which was really appealing to him um he had really bad um seasickness <laughs> so he was miserable um for a lot of the time that they were on this journey um and because they went to these interesting places so far away from his home in Great Britain, right? Basically everywhere they traveled was in the Southern hemisphere and they literally like in, encircled the globe. Um, he went to all these really interesting places that, you know, your, your typical, um, you know, Brit British person at the time would not have any experience with. Um, he was um, a big reader. Um, and while he was traveling, he was reading a lot about like, you know, sort of modern to his time interpretations of geology and all that kind of stuff. And so he, based on what he was reading and what he was seeing, he, he get, he got these ideas about, you know, life changing and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things, so there's a, another video that I linked, um, that is not mine, right? It's a YouTube video that, um, is optional. You don't have to watch it if you don't want to, but it's a really interesting kind of like biography of, of Charles Darwin and it's kind of cool. But anyway, he, um, he, oh, I lost my train of thought. What was I about to say? Uh, 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 uh. Talked about him, young man, aimless, went on the boat. Oh, um, <laughs> Ultimately, he, he wrote a book that you may have heard of before called um, The Origin of the Species. That's not the whole title, actually. Um, and one of the things that's really kind of cute about that is that he, while many people call him the father of evolution, he only used the word evolution once in his book, and it was in the very last sentence. So he didn't call what he was observing evolution what he called it was descent with modification. So we'll talk more about that. So here's a little timeline. I, I definitely don't expect you to memorize this, but it is kind of interesting to sort of look at the progression of time in all of this, okay? One thing I do wanna spend a little bit of time talking about is, is some of the influences on Darwin. So, um, you know, back in ancient history, <laughs> right? At least ancient Western history, um, the ancient Greeks um, believed that species were permanent, they were unchanging, right? Um, some Greek philosophers sort of had this idea of this ladder of life, right? So, you know, humans are above other, you know, animals, and then like at the bottom are things like worms, because they didn't really know there was anything smaller than that that was alive. And above humans were angels, right? So they had this idea of like, you have this fixed, you know, hierarchy, if you will, of life. Um, 
And then, of course, later on, we have the, you know, Judeo-Christian tradition, all of the Abrahamic religions, which, um, you know, kind of all say that, you know, God created, you know, the earth in, in seven days and six, well, six days and then rested. But anyway, you get the idea, right? Um, and everything is kind of static. Um, 150 years before Darwin was born, um, people started finding fossils. And, and the really interesting thing about that is... Um, that you know many of our not all but many of our you know mythological creatures i several of you guys um in your introduction were like dragons uh, you know the myth of dragons um comes from finding dinosaurs right finding dinosaur bones and being like oh yeah this is evidence that there are these you know big lizardy things that are terrifying right um and so people started finding fossils and and really sort of wondering well so does this mean there were organisms that aren't here anymore and you know there was a lot of this kind of idea of like well what's that about and anyway okay um there was um actually somebody who had this idea of evolution before darwin did and his name was jean baptiste de lamarck and Lamarck was, you like my French? I know you do, I can tell. Um, Lamarck was interesting because he had a concept of evolution, which turns out to be incorrect, at least mostly incorrect. Um, but he had this idea of species changing over time. So actually Darwin wasn't the first person to come up with this idea, as it turns out. Darwin was the first person to kind of, well, tied for the first person to kind of figure out, um, you know, the details, okay, of, that are, that are, that we still find to be accurate, okay. Um, around the time that Darwin was, you know, learning about the world, um, there were a lot of geologists that were starting to question the idea that the earth um, was only, you know, a couple thousand years old, because they were um, seeing these geological processes, right, and making measurements and looking at, well, you know, how do you get mountains? How do you get canyons? What are the geological processes that would produce these kinds of things? How long would they take, right, and kind of learning about some of that stuff, they were starting to think, well, then, I mean, the earth can't be just 4,000 years old, right? So, so that was, and that was some of what Darwin's reading. And so there was this kind of coming together of ideas, right? There was a lot of sort of enlightenment in, um, in sciences at this time, right? People learning about things and, and thinking about things. Um, so Chuck, um, <laughs> Chuck, uh, it, you know, went on his trip, saw all kinds of things, collected all kinds of animals, started writing. Um, throughout his adult life, he was writing about his hypotheses and his ideas about, you know, what he saw. Um, and he knew that if he published his ideas, that it would be a big deal, like a big deal. Um, and so he kind of, he kind of delayed right? He kind of was like, uh, people aren't going to like this, you know, people are going to be really uncomfortable with this, because the vast majority of Europeans at that time, of course, still very much, you know, believed the story of Genesis, and that, you know, that whole idea, um, and so, um, so he knew he'd get some pushback, and so he was kind of uncomfortable with that, um, and then um, in the, um, in the 1850s, um, he got a letter from a guy named Alfred R Russell Wallace, who was another um, naturalist like Darwin, um, who also traveled, right, and um, independently came up with essentially this, the same ideas that Darwin did. He, he traveled to different parts of the world. He was in the um, he was in Indonesia, I believe, and the sort of, you know, Southeast Asia is where he was traveling. Um, but he came up with this idea of descent with modification as well. And so he sent a letter um, to Darwin, like, hey, here's my manuscript. What do you think about this? Right? Because he knew that Darwin knew, you know, some things. And, and Darwin was like, ah, crap, looks like I got to publish. <laughs> so Darwin finally got his button gear and finally published um, his ideas, his thoughts. Um, and so 
and the title of the book is On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And so most people just call it origin of spe the origin of species. Um, and so he, he essentially, you know, ended up, you know, getting the, all the recognition you know, for good and bad, <laughs> right? Um, and Wallace got bup kiss. So that's kind of a bummer for him. But mm. oh well, these things happen, unfortunately. Um, so there it is. But we're trying to, you know, trying to give him a little shout out here, I guess. Okay. Um, and then here's another little timeline that just kind of gives you some dates. I absolutely do not want you to memorize dates, right? It's just kind of interesting to look at you know, sort of this progression and how long everything took. Another thing I want to mention, right? So here's, here's when Wallace sent his stuff to Darwin and Darwin's like, oh crap, I better, <laughs> I better hurry up, right? So Darwin had been sitting on that, on his writings for a while, <laughs> right? <laughs> Over 10 years. And then it was like, oh, I better, I better get my butt in gear, okay? Um, one of the things that I find especially charming about the life of, um, about this time period, I should, should say, not about Darwin's life, is that um, Gregor Mendel, who we will talk about when we talk about genetics, was a contemporary of Darwin. They were active at the same time. They were both um, very religious. They were both naturalists. Um, and Mendel did some of the earliest sort of quality work on genetics. And what I think is charming is that Mendel and Darwin knew nothing of each other really at all. Like they didn't, they didn't know that as it turns out, they were actually studying things that were really complementary. And if they had communicated, um, that would have been like huge for both of them. It would have been like, oh, oh, right. So that's just, you know, kind of an, kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting thing, right? Is that they were, they were working on some of these really big fundamental biological questions at the same time, right? Um, so I don't know, but if you want to read some read some more of this, that's fine. So you know, a lot of sort of geologists as well as Lamarck there, kind of having these ideas of you know um, the age of the Earth and things changing and extinctions and and all that kind of stuff. Once again, you don't need to memorize all these names, right? I'm just trying to give you a little bit of kind of framework. Um, Right, and then there's kind of like a little summary of you know worldview before and after Darwin. Okay, um, one of the places, and certainly this is not the only place that Darwin visited, but one of the places that Darwin visited um, that was really interesting are the Galapagos Islands. And so the Galapagos Islands are a chain of islands that are off the coast of South America. So you can see them right there, right along the equator. Yeah. And they are really unique for a variety of reasons. But one of the things that's cool about them is that they're pretty far away from the mainland. So they're really quite isolated. Okay. Um, and that makes them rather unique, right? Because there's not a lot of organisms traveling back and forth between the mainland right and this small chain of islands although organisms do go from one island to the next occasionally right um you know there's not a lot of influx of of animals and plants from the mainland um and so what he observed on the galapagos islands is he observed all of these really like unique interesting animals that in some ways were similar to um other species in south america um in other ways were really different and even within that chain of islands he saw a lot of like specialization within different critters so um galapagos tortoises get a lot of um attention because they're huge and adorable and they live a bazillion years not really a bazillion but they do have an incredibly long lifespan in fact um um, I want to say it was about 10 years ago now. Um, they, the records are kind of iffy, but um, about 10 years ago in Australia, one of their super old Galapagos tortoises that was living in a zoo, they thought they, you know, it is believed that that tortoise actually was collected by Charles Darwin when he was traveling to the Galapagos and that tortoise found himself you know later on in life in a in a zoo in Australia um and so that tortoise just died like 10 years ago which I find you know just kind of amazing right so they have these incredibly long lifespans 
Um, but what's really interesting about them biologically is that each island has very specific tortoises and their bodies are quite different from the tortoises on other islands. The shape of their shell is different. Um, the length of their neck is different. Sort of, you know, their body size is a little bit different. And so, um, so they're really kind of unique to where they live, right? Which is kind of interesting. Um, the other picture on this slide is of a marine iguana. And if you have seen any of the new the new um, Godzilla movies, new with air quotes because they're not that new anymore, but you know what I'm saying. Like not the old, old, original, like, you know, Japanese Godzilla movies, but the new ones, they totally based Godzilla off of a marine iguana because you look at the marine iguana and you're like, oh yeah, that's Godzilla, just, you know, only this big instead of, you know, that big, um, <laughs> right? And so um, marine iguanas are so weird because um, normally iguanas live in trees, right? And they eat, you know, whatever they can get to, bugs plant material you know little critters whatever um but marine iguanas actually hunt with air quotes because mostly they eat algae so they actually swim around in these like rocky coasts and they have really flat instead of having pointy faces like typical iguanas do they have these really like fat stump like flat sort of stumpy faces and they like nibble algae off of rocks right? And they're just, they're so weird. They have these tall spines and these big flat tails to make them better swimmers because a normal iguana is not a particularly great swimmer. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, so he saw all this stuff and he was like, wow, there's something, why are they so different from, you know, why are marine iguanas so different from the South American iguanas? Why are the tortoises here so different from each other and different from, you know, tortoises on the mainland? What, 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 right? And then he saw the finches, Oh man, and we'll talk more about the finches later, but on the Galapagos Islands, there is this incredible diversity of finches that are really weird. Um, there's only a couple different kinds of finches um, in, you know, sort of coastal mainland um, South America near where, you know, kind of parallel to, I guess, um, the Galapagos Islands, and yet there's a, you know, a couple dozen really unique species of finches um, on the Galapagos, and they do all kinds of really neat, interesting things, and they eat all kinds of really interesting foods, and they're just really, like, as far as finches go, totally wackadoo, so, um, so we're going to talk about those a little bit more, but that was a big influence for him as well, so the, the kind of crazy unique things, including this diversity of um, finches, um, and so there's a little kind of diagram of all of the all the different finches we'll talk more about that later okay um, another thing that was a big influence on on Darwin is the um, concept of domestication so um, domestication also often referred to as artificial selection artificial selection is basically when humans choose um, traits that we find desirable and we intentionally breed um, individual organisms that have traits that we like to try to kind of make organisms that are useful or interesting to us okay and so basically any plant you eat I'm being bold right now in saying that, but, but virtually every plant you eat has been domesticated. And so there is some sort of wild relative of that plant that exists or it did at one time. And, um, you know, that had some potential to be delicious food and people start tinkering with it. So um, I got two nice examples for you that are pretty, pretty easy, pretty visual. Okay. So one of them, this is um, wild strawberries. So wild strawberries, as they exist in nature, when humans aren't, you know, messing with them um, are delicious. They're incredible. They're actually super, super tasty, but look at how small the delicious red fruity part is compared to the seeds and the seeds are kind of big. Right. And then look at that compared to, you know, the strawberries that you buy at the grocery store, honking, and they keep getting bigger. I mean, I swear, when I was a kid, it was like strawberries were normal size, and now they're like, you know, sometimes you get a strawberry, and you're like, that's not, like, I have to cut it up to eat it, or like, I'm eating it like an apple. It's, you know, anyway, um, so we keep choosing traits, right, and then sort of intentionally breeding to get more of the traits that we like and sort of reduce the traits that we don't like, right? So we don't like the seeds that much. So we choose 
to breed plants that have smaller and smaller seeds. You know, we like the red, juicy, delicious part. So we choose, yeah, okay. Um, this example on the left side, this is wild mustard. And so wild mustard is, uh, it's beautiful when it's alive. It's beautiful from far away. Up close, it's not so pretty. And after it dries up and dies, it's an annual. So that means it dies every year. Um, it's not pretty at all. It's pretty ugly. Um, but wild mustard is the ancestor of all of these vegetables down here. Okay, so all of the so-called cruciferous vegetables, cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, um, Brussels sprouts, right? All of those, um, kohlrabi, if you're familiar with that, um, all of those things, broccoli rob, right? All of those different plants um, have all been domesticated from wild mustard, right? Um, and so for each of those, we've kind of chosen traits right, that we are intentionally kind of focusing on when we're choosing to breed the plant. So, oh, you want something that makes leaves that are nice and compact, right, and there's, you know, not a lot of other parts to it, just a big ball of leaves, oh, you get cabbage. You're looking at flowers. By the way, when you eat broccoli and cauliflower, you're eating flowers. Uh, you know, they're closed, closed flower buds, right, but ultimately they're flowers, right, so, oh, I like, you know, this part's delicious, right, so let's grow more of that, right, or, oh, I like this really leafy thing, you know, right, so all of these are domesticated versions, essentially, of, um, of wild mustard, and so we've done this, not just with plants, and these are only two examples, like, I could give you a bazillion, um, we've also done this with animals, and so, all of our, you know, farm animals, right? All the livestock that we grow is all domesticated, meaning we've chosen traits, right? So it is not in the wild nature of a cow-like critter to tolerate people because they're prey species, right? And so natural, you know, bovines, right? That are, that are wild and haven't been domesticated generally are not super tolerant of people right? But if you want to grow some cows to, you know, produce milk or, you know, raise them for beef or whatever, you have to pick animals that are calm around people so that you can, you know, so that you don't get stampeded, <laughs> right? And so we domesticate for all kinds of things, for physical traits, for personality traits, right? If you're trying to um, use milk, right, from a, from a cow or a goat or whoever you're, you know, um, milking, um, you want one that makes a lot of milk for a long period of time, right? It's more efficient that way, right? And so that's all stuff that's been domesticated, okay? Um, the example they talk about uh, with animal domestication as an example of artificial selection in your book is um, dogs, because in dogs, it's just like so amazingly like vivid and clear what effect artificial selection has been able to have. So, um, and you guys are a group of dog lovers, man, huge group of dog lovers. So <laughs> I think that was like, I don't know, it's always a huge proportion of, um, of everybody's favorite animal. So, um, you know, here, here's a selection of dogs for you to look at. Um, all dog breeds are related to, right, um, wolves right? Wolves are the common ancestor of all modern dogs. All modern dogs, by the way, are considered the same species, and we'll talk more about what it means to be a species later on, um, but, but different dog breeds have been bred to have different traits, and those are all extraordinarily intentional, right? So let's pick one to talk about. Which, which one do we want to talk about? Let's talk about a beagle, because I have one. Um, so on the bottom right is a beagle. Beagles have these, the, the sort of defining feature of a beagle is they're pretty small. They're not big dogs. Um, they have these beautiful, soft, pendulous ears, right? Excuse me, madam. Raven was bred to be a jerk, apparently. Um, she is mixed breed, so she has a handful of traits, um, you know, that are domesticated, but she's kind of a mixture of things. So is Luna. Luna never jumps on me during videos, though. Luna's the, Luna's calmer. Anyway, okay, so back to beagles. Um, so they have these soft, velvety, pendulous ears, and, um, 
they also have no, look at that little tail look at that little booty on that on that beagle right so soft velvety pendulous ears look at that tail beagles almost always have a white tip on their tail right if a beagle didn't have a white tip on its tail it would be considered a major flaw in that animal right if you were into into purebred dogs um right and like i said they're of a pretty consistent size so why why right how do you get from this to that all right well um beagles were bred to be scent hounds they're an example of a scent hound so what do scent hounds do scent hounds are hunting dogs that um their job is to find a scent trail from whatever prey you're trying to get and to tell the hunter where the prey is okay so scent hounds characteristically other scent hounds too like basset hounds there's a basset hound up here um fox hounds and any other scent hounds they all tend to have these droopy round ears right yes they're cute but that's not why they have that characteristic bred into them the reason they have those pendulous ears is then when they're sniffing the trail they put their head down their nose to the ground right their ears kind of make this like funnel right and that helps them sniff even better okay so while i chose to have a beagle because i thought the ears were cute and soft and lovely right the reason they were bred that way is for finding a scent right and the reason that beagles have white tipped tails why do you think so there's a small little dog it's running in the woods they also bark a lot oh most of them mine haven't mine are not big barkers but right they tend to be known for being howlers and barkers um so you know they're running through the woods right somebody is following them usually on um foot right the hunter usually follows the pack of beagles on foot um, because they're little right if it's fox hounds or bigger hounds than on horseback but you know beagles you, you follow on foot um and so the beagles chasing after a rabbit right they smell a rabbit and they're chasing after a rabbit so they're barking to be like hey 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 the rabbit's over here hey 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 right and the other thing is think about they're hunting in forest right and they're pretty brown black colored for the most part and the you know plants are you know also kind of that color so their little white tails like a little flag like hey hey i'm over here i'm over here follow me right so they have these characteristics these characteristics have been bred into them with a specific goal in mind okay and so in darwin's case he was more impressed with um artificial selection in like race horses so you know we breed horses to be faster and faster and faster and faster right um and so you know domestication is a type of selection and that got darwin thinking about well so in nature do you have this similar kind of thing but instead of you know people sort of deciding these are the traits i want to see in this animal does nature kind of do it on its own right where some characteristics are are favorable and some are not okay and so that got him thinking right about this idea that we now call natural selection so here's an example of natural selection so right the the there are you know lots of different um species of canines around the world um and they're all a little bit different from each other they're all canines right but they're all a little bit different from each other and um they all have traits that make them pretty well adapted for where they live and so if you look at these animals even if you've never if you're not familiar with an african wild dog you've never heard of one before right even if we didn't have it in a picture where you could see the landscape around it by looking at it you could figure out some things about it right okay it's got long legs so it's probably you know long legs probably means it's a good runner um also probably means that it you know has to have long legs to traverse through wherever it lives so you know tall grass um another thing that's unique about african wild dogs is their fur is really short so compared to some other wild dogs like wolves and foxes um their fur is really really short so you know what's the advantage of that right and they also have really big ears that's kind of interesting and so most wild dogs have large ears but wild but african wild dogs have you know especially big ears and you know so you can look at these characteristics and you think can think about where they live 
right? And how they live. And, and a lot of it, it kind of goes together, right? Um, and so you can see these patterns where, you know, if you're going to live in um, North America with cold winters, specifically, you know, northern North America, I'm, ta I'm looking at you, Canada, right? <laughs> Canada and the, and the northern U.S., um, you know, wolves in those areas have an incredibly thick, furry coat, right? Because they, you know, have to be active out in the snow, right? But an African wild dog would not do well with a thick furry coat because it's hot where they live, right? And so we have a short coat, right? Um, and then you can see um, our utility player here is the coyote, right? Coyotes can, coyotes are extremely adaptive, right? They can live all kinds of places. Um, you know, they're kind of medium sized. They have kind of a medium coat. It can kind of go either way. Um, they're, they're smart little critters, right? And they can easily live where people live, right? So, you know, regularly we have a pack of coyotes that, you know, runs down the street in our neighborhood, right? And so they, they, they're really, really um, interesting in that way. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Okay. So, so that's natural selection, okay? And so this idea of the influences of the geologists that he was listening to, in addition to, you know, learning about domestication, in addition to looking at these, um, you know, unique creatures that he saw on his travels, right? All of this kind of led to Darwin coming up with the idea of natural selection. Okay, um, and so what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to try to keep these videos a little bit more manageable. So I'm going to stop here, and then the next video we're going to talk about what natural selection is. Okay, so let's stop and we'll pick up again.